Hello, welcome to Conscious TV. I'm Ian McNay, and I have with me Renata McNay Hello. on my left. And we're both going to interview Theodore Widinski, um, who we're going to call Ted, because Theodore's a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> and uh, Ted has written um, a book which we both really enjoyed called, I'll give you the full title, Instinctual Intelligence, The Primal Wisdom of the Nervous System and the Evolution of human nature. And this is kind of a part two. We've just done one interview with Ted, and this time we're going to go more into how the instincts, if they're not evolved, if they're not balanced, can hold us in trauma and addiction, which keeps the personality really tight and then contracted. And that in itself doesn't give us the potential to live our human life as we could and also limits us in how we see the bigger picture of who we really are. So, um, Ted, one thing that interested me from the notes that you gave me, um, and we've covered some of this in the first interview, but you were saying that standard forms of psychotherapy did not always, you found, did not always last, have lasting change, that people would have psychotherapy, mm -hmm. do lots of work, and yet they'd revert back to their old patterns and their old use of the instincts. Just yep. explain what you meant by that. Well, if we look at the history of uh, psychotherapy over the course of, uh, say, uh, beginning with Freud and over the uh, last uh, <clears throat> 100 years or so, even more now, that uh, many of the uh, forms of therapy about talking, uh, uh, you know, the person telling the, 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 the analyst about their problems or difficulties in childhood and so on, was very helpful in alleviating many of the neurotic symptoms that they were suffering from. But there was a whole class of people who had different types of what we'll say more intense or more, now we use the word, traumatic experiences that didn't seem to be helpful to really uh, talk about it or understand. Um, people could consciously acknowledge it, but it didn't seem to make a difference in their day-to-day -day behavior. They had the same kind of uh, either uh, inhibitions or anxiety, stress, and so on. They really have a hard time functioning um, even at the most basic levels in their life. And especially as we discuss people coming back from war, World War I, World War II, uh, they really did not know how to help those people with any uh, significant forms of therapy. And it's only in the last, say, 10, 15 years that uh, this uh, scientific research on trauma and the development of it as a uh, field, a specialty within psychotherapy that has really begun to help people understand what's going on in their nervous system, how it became uh, dysfunctional, and how it can be uh, restored to its normal healthy functioning. I, I know that you did um, some work with both Peter Levine and Pat Ogden, which is the somatic experiencing work, mm -hmm. which is very much for working with trauma. But the interesting thing that I find more and more is that we're all traumatized. <laughs> and it's OK, certain people have the extremes that are obvious. Mm -hmm. But in our own way, we've all had some trauma that is unresolved somehow, which is restrictive in our development. Yeah, you could say that any, anything that uh, impacted and influenced the nervous system to function in a less than optimal way, we could, we could say is a traumatic experience. It's a non-optimal experience for the human being that forces the natural, healthy vibrancy of our instincts, our emotions, and our cognitive patterns to go, uh, to function in ways that are not um, realistic or adaptive to the, to the current environment. So that's a good way of, of characterizing it almost, that we've all been had experiences that have somehow uh, limited the natural vibrancy and health that, uh, that is the kind of the birthright of a, of a human being. Uh, what was so interesting for me in my own experience, um, which I had a few months ago, I had this feeling, I want to know if there is a trauma in my body. Mm. I'm holding some kind of trauma. I wasn't aware of a trauma and uh, I called the trauma therapist and I said, you know, I don't know if I have a trauma, I just feel interested in finding out. 
And she said, if there is a trauma in your body, the body will show us. And it was so fascinating because she just said, just stay with your body. What do you feel? Mm. And then, you know, I started feeling certain things. And then I would talk about it. And, um, and with certain things, then I had a few sessions with certain things. I got a picture of what it was related to, but certain things I didn't get a picture. Mm. And then I actually experienced, with her guidance, how my body started to discharge. Mm. It was, it's just wonderful how to experience how it is in the body and the intelligence of the body. Once you bring your awareness and you allow it, it will tell. You, mm -hmm. or it will tell us mm -hmm. what's going on. Mm, that sounds really beautiful, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can see it had a change for you. Huh? Yeah, and I think that was missing in the, in the old type of psychotherapy. Right, it was more about what you're um, thinking yes. or even about what you're feeling, mm -hmm. but not so much the uh, kind of nonverbal wisdom of the body that might yeah. not be articulated in words. And that's been the movement in the, in the past uh, 15 to 10 years, mm -hmm. really training uh, therapists about how to look at the body, uh, understand what's going on the other person, and also ask the, learn to write the, ask the right questions to really help them uh, land in their embodied experience. So that, as you said, the, beautifully, the natural healing process of the body can start to um, come to uh, it's, it's, uh, express itself naturally without the inhibition of our minds and the doubts and fears that we might have about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you talk about in the book about how emotionally intense experiences can send the nervous system into a shock. So mm -hmm. what's basically happening as I understand it is every time something happens that is outside our comfort zone, somewhere that's registering in the body, it's mm -hmm. kind of somewhere the body's contracting and, and, that, and that shock is somewhere in us. It might be a fairly major thing. It might be quite a minor thing. And, 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 and a little bit I know about the, uh, the somatic work, the trauma work, is that actually there's, there's, a, there's a, a process that animals go through, like a release process, that we as human beings are not used to doing. Can you just talk us through how that works? You call yeah. it the polar bear experience in your <laughs> yes. book. Yes, that was uh, one of Peter Levine's great insights, one of the... Uh, an American researcher and therapist who uh, was really quite brilliant and I think in many ways is kind of responsible for the whole shift in our understanding of um, treatment of trauma. He was watching a film one day about a polar bear that was uh, captured in the Arctic for a um, scientific study and they kind of shot it with some kind of um, tranquilizing uh, substance and it kind of fell over asleep. And then they manipulated it and they were testing inside its mouth and doing all these things. And then finally it started, to, the tranquilizer wore off and it started to wake up and they all ran away because it's a large, dangerous animal. And the polar bear promptly kind of stood up, sat there for me, you could see it was like disoriented and then just started shaking and shaking and shaking for two, three minutes just vigorously. And now it stopped and it just started walking as if nothing had happened. So he saw that as a, a natural uh, capacity of, that many animals have to uh, kind of shake off or uh, just immediately discharge this energy and the memory of it from their nervous system in a way that wouldn't uh, affect them anymore. And I think over the course of evolution, animals, uh, particular individuals of any species that had that capacity really survived, thrived, and reproduced and the ones who couldn't discharge that trauma um, tended to hang on to it, didn't fare very well, couldn't survive, and eventually died off. So in a way, that, that's why that we see the extraordinary resiliency of the animal kingdom in that way. So how does it actually feel in a body who is traumatized? <sighs> well, that's a, a great question. And all, one of the ways it, it doesn't feel, that's part of the problem, is that a lot of uh, what happens is the fundamental mechanism of dissociation 
takes people who have experienced uh, traumatic uh, events in their life, or it can be loss also, anything that was painful or harmful to the nervous system. And, it, and one way of uh, protecting the people, uh, the, human the human nervous system from being overwhelmed by this trauma is to not sense one's body anymore, not be aware of that pain, of the tension that can come from it, or the complete uh, inhibition kind of frozenness that can also arise from it, and the emotional pain associated with it, to just largely uh, be much more aware of one's thoughts and not so aware of the feelings or the sensations of the body. So for a lot of people, um, they don't uh, experience their body as having this trauma. They just experience a lot of rapid thoughts um, a lot of concern with maybe safety or for people who have uh, suffered uh, some kind of sexual trauma or abuse, they're preoccupied with sexual thoughts. Uh, some of the behaviors that they go through have a feeling, but it's largely unconscious. It's really not something uh, that they're aware of. It's much more the compulsive mental activity that dominates uh, many people uh, or a feeling of uh, depression or a lack of uh, emotional vitality. The, the, the word you use is disassociation mm -hmm. in the book, and, and that, that seems to me to encompass what you're talking about insofar as that we don't really feel, we don't somehow embody the feeling in a healthy way. So there's a disassociation, there's a removal from the event that has been a shock or a mm -hmm. trauma or whatever. And because of that, somehow it doesn't complete itself. And that's where the example of the polar bear is really good. And I'm, I'm going to tell a story now, which we, because we, cause cause, um, we've got snow in England today. <laughs> and when the snow happens, everything seems to uh, break down, even though it's not very, uh, very much snow. And so we had two guests that were coming up <coughs> with, aren't able to come because the, train, the train's not running. But he was telling me a story when I talked to him last night about what happened to him. He works as a trauma therapist. And he gave an example of a situation which was incredibly traumatizing, but he, he wasn't traumatized because of, because of how he was. And he was caught in the 2004 tsunami with his family in a beach hut. And um, they were inside the hut, and, 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 and it started to slowly fill up with water. And there was less and less air they had to get. He and his two sons he was holding on to had to... Um, get higher and higher up the hut to get the air that was left. And in the end, he made the decision, and, and he was, it was like he was fighting, and he was moving. So in the end, his decision was to, he would sacrifice himself for his two sons, mm -hmm. because he didn't want his sons not to die and he to live. So he put his sons up, they were quite young, and his head came down in the water. At that point, miraculously, the, the hut kind of collapsed, and they were then thrown out onto the beach, and of course, they survived, and he survived to tell the story. And I said, well, that must have been very traumatic. He said, it was, but the trauma didn't stay with me because of the movement I had. I was, I was fighting, and it was a, there was a natural flow, and he didn't need to clear anything afterwards because his body had cleared it. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was, that was very interesting how, if we follow through, we don't freeze in fright or helplessness, mm -hmm. then the body can act naturally. I think that's a great way, a great example of, of the basic theory underlying uh, uh, the treatment of trauma is that uh, when we're in uh, a dangerous situation, in cases of abuse, violence, uh, there are many uh, cases where this is true. It's not always the case, but the body uh, wants to uh, engage in defensive actions to protect ourselves. And if we're not able to do that, especially uh, children that experience uh, violence or abuse of some kind, they're not able to either run away, the, the flight mechanism, or fight back, the fight instinct. Um, usually the only response they have is either a uh, kind of protective freezing response or they actually have to work with the person who's tormenting them. It's called an attachment response in that situation. So they develop a way to keep safe by befriending their tormentor. And those are uh, brilliant human mechanisms of surviving incredibly dangerous situations. The only problem is uh, it's, uh, there's a need to suppress these more active fight or flight responses. The body wants to complete some action. 
So that, in the, in the, in the way of, of speaking about it in, in trauma therapy, is to help guide our clients back to these uh, scenarios where their original action was suppressed and allow the body to complete whatever yeah. it wanted to do in that particular situation. You never know what form it's going to take. So your example of this man uh, struggling to keep uh, above the water, protecting his sons, that's exactly what the instinctual action that he needed to do. So in mm. the sense that he was complete and the, the intense experience wasn't traumatic for him, wasn't inhibiting on his nervous system. But it could have been different, you know, given any variety of circumstances. And yet there are probably other people in a similar situation who freeze. Absolutely, yeah. And, I mean, what decides in us mm -hmm. to, to move and what decides to be frozen? I mean, I, I can imagine uh, his desire, his love for his children Absolutely, yeah. was the very force which kept, kept him moving. Yeah, sometimes for mm -hmm. our own protection we might be more inhibited, but we yeah. find sources of courage to protect loved ones that are, uh, you know, kind of, there's a lot of stories of uh, humans doing extraordinary things for the mm -hmm. sake of others that they probably wouldn't have found the energy uh, for themselves. So it's really quite... Uh, uh, touching that instinctual capacity to protect and defend one's children can kind of uh, supersede everything else. Yeah, I was, I was reading several years ago this story which happened in America. Um, a, a small child got run over by a, by a car mm -hmm. and uh, one of the wheel actually was standing on the child and there was the mother who in this situation was able to lift the car mm -hmm. to get her child out. Yeah. It's incredible the force and the power. Isn't it extraordinary? Yeah. It is. And it turns out uh, the mechanism for that is really what uh, prevents a lot of humans from lifting a heavy object is not a lack of strength, it's the incredible pain that one experiences in one's joints and muscles actually ripping or being damaged. So women's capacity have an instinctual capacity because of childbirth and so on, sometimes to override pain um, in ways yeah, that some men imagine. can't tolerate. Uh, yeah. Women have an instinctual mechanism, especially when their kids are at stake, uh, mm. to kind of override that pain and actually do these almost uh, superhuman feats. It's yeah. all about surviving, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> Not only our own survival, but our children's exactly. survival. It has to go on. Yeah, it does, yes. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if, if we were just to, to move on slightly to addiction, which is slightly different in, in form to trauma, mm -hmm. but it also is quite dramatic what it does to the nervous system. Just talk us through not just the, the obvious addictions we think of as, as, as drugs and alcohol, but how we're all addicted in some way. Mm -hmm. to our lifestyle and to, and to our programs. Well, that's a, a, a good way to put it, I think. If you look at our uh, modern culture and our modern society, certainly just arriving here in London, it's really no different from my life in San Francisco. People walk around quite busy with their uh, digital mobile devices and so on. Uh, you could say that addiction is anything that kind of captures our attention, focuses our awareness in a pattern that really excludes uh, other things kind of to the detriment of our own life. It's one thing to be focused on a task that you need to support yourself and so on, but there's a choice when you're done with that task to let it go. But with, uh, with the addictive mind, for whatever we're addicted to, God knows there are so many things, substances, pornography that we spoke of. Um, some people are addicted to being on Facebook, their computers, um, relationships. It can be a drama, we, we've talked about also that it's the repetitive pattern that focuses our awareness in a way to the unhealthy exclusion of everything else. And for um, uh, all our modern sophistication, our world is quite good at making products that capture attention, whether it's the news that's presenting or the latest terrorist attacks. It's always drama on the news. In America, yeah, yeah, it's very yeah. overblown and always designed to galvanize your awareness to pay attention to something that you just can't, everything else kind of drops off. And our human, again, it takes advantage of kind of the evolved 
predisposition of the human mind to focus on uh, elements of danger in our lives briefly to the exclusion of everything else to help us survive. But if we're always doing that, that's one way of classifying an addictive uh, behavior to really that the rest of your life isn't getting the attention that it really needs. So are we actually addicted to something outside or are we, do we get addicted to this chemical rush inside? Hmm. That's a good question, yeah. From, from that point of view, you could say it's more of an internal uh, process. And the, uh, in our modern world, uh, advertisers, people who make all these products, are quite skilled at uh, knowing exactly yeah. how the brain works yeah. and delivering that in a way that uh, has the potential to be uh, addictive. It's also extremely helpful. Uh, it's, it's a balance each person has to find with what's truly uh, helpful and productive. And uh, But again, balance, I think, is the word we keep coming back yeah, to. Maybe it keeps also the economy in balance. <laughs> <laughs> For the moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just about. You see, I, I just get the feeling the more we talk about this, the more I look at this, that what's actually happening is we're losing more and more our ability to tune in and feel the intelligence that's in the body. Yes. So both with the addiction, we're talking about the chemical rush here. Mm -hmm. With the trauma, we're talking about the disassociation mm -hmm. from the feeling of the trauma. And when we were talking earlier in our first interview, about this balance between meditation and understanding how we work in terms of our mind, it, 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 the key seems to be coming back to how we feel in our bodies. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that doesn't mean, oh, I feel energized because I'm racing to do something. It's going beyond that. It's coming back to what is a, more of a depth of a feeling in, in the body. Mm -hmm. I think that's really, uh, that we talked about that in the other program, but just uh, the mechanism of paying attention to one's physical sensations, especially the breath, sets up, uh, uh, like kind of triggers uh, neurological programs inside the brain that tell the, the areas that are uh, secreting stress hormones or telling us to be on alert, it tells them to calm down. It's a very effective mechanism used by, uh, uh, you know, traditional cultures in the past and now as a, as a core part of uh, a treatment of trauma and addiction is to actually begin to sense your body as a, as a starting point. But it's hard almost to break that uh, addiction to the, to the outside world. We think we're going to miss something or uh, it's like a desperation yeah. almost. Well, no, I, I know I have that. I, I, yeah. I kind of, you think, well, you've got, you've got this one life. I know. Some people think there's lots of past lives and mm -hmm. future lives. I, I don't know about that. I know I've got this one life, and I want to live that life. I want to experience. I want to learn. All those things. And, 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 and the lure, the kind of the attraction of all the things you can do on the outside yeah. gets more and more and more. And so there's always, these, there's always this seduction from the outside, whereas, of course, as, you, as you've hinted, the balance, the balance involved of the enjoying the outside. Mm -hmm. but not at the expense of the balance of the inside. And even more so when people have a, a trauma in their system can really predispose them to be monitoring the external environment for some signs of danger or the re, you know, possibility of being harmed again in such an intense way that it really is hard to begin to bring them in to their own body. And that's usually why we start with the interpersonal connection. They, uh, helping them uh, feel attached and secure in the presence of another human being has a lot of innate mechanisms that calm the nervous system down and is often a starting point and that uh, building that relationship with them takes time. You know, when, um, when you talked about, you know, feeling the body and how important it is, knowing what's going on, we, going on, we never really learn as children to feel what's in our body, you know. And I became aware recently when I was visiting my grandchildren and my little granddaughter was really sad over something. And my son took her and said, it is okay to be sad. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was sad, my mother tried to make me happy in this moment. 
or I was angry, then my, my parents did something to stop me from being angry. Yeah, so we learn it's not okay what we feel in our body. That's what we learned. Yeah. You know, and then, of course, our senses go outside, I guess, and we look for all this pleasure outside and disconnect. Mm -hmm. as, as you say that, I think to myself, my God, what are we always teaching our children in school? It's always about yeah. the alphabet or about science, all yeah. great things yeah. to learn. Yeah. I don't ever remember a classroom ever that actually stopped a child and said, okay, you know, uh, what does your heart feel like? What, what are your, yeah. where, do your, where are your feelings in your body? Any, even the most basic. it's fine to yeah. be that way because so we, what, we, what, what the problem with that is we learn, we, we forget who we are. You know, we forget because that's, that is who we are, mm -hmm. you know, as a human being. Yeah. Sometimes we get angry, sometimes we have bliss, sometimes we are happy, sometimes we are sad. And so, uh, we lose all that, and now we try so hard to relearn it again. <laughs> As adults, yes. <laughs> yeah. What the do I feel now? Know. What do yeah. I feel now? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. it, it makes me think, like even to the kids are running around, um, just to have them stop for thirty seconds and just feel their bodies. Yeah. What a um, uh, what what kind of children would that produce? It'd be interesting to see how that affects Probably them. Probably with a common nervous system. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, yeah. More self-aware in some way. Yeah, yeah. You also talk in the book about the adaptability and the evolution mm. of the nervous system, and so the in a way in a way we are adapting to the challenges of modern society, but of course that adaptation to some extent has to be integrated in terms of of how we're able to move and not move too fast that for our body to be able to catch up and to mm -hmm. evolve. So how do you see the nervous system? It's obviously changed a lot from the human being since we were, we were living very simplistic lives. Mm -hmm. how, how do you see the potential for our nervous system to develop over the next few years? Uh, 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 you mean like a, a future generations of human yes, beings? Yes, because, okay. because life is not fundamentally going to change. And we've seen so many cases where, um, let, let's, t let's take somebody 200 years ago, they, there's no way they could drive a car mm -hmm. and, and be on their mobile phone at the same time. Oh, uh, all those people do it. No, people I, do I, all this I'm, I'm not sure that's true, actually. Uh, the human okay. uh, nervous system uh, it basically is at least the same as it was about 10,000 years ago, if not more. Okay. Genetic change, it is thought, uh, generally takes about 10,000 years for some kind of environmental pressure to really act on the process of natural selection to actually result in enough uh, genetic uh, mutation and selection over time to produce a, a new trait that's more adaptive. It just a few generations won't do it. So in some sense, we're dealing, we're, we uh, human beings in the modern age are stuck with a nervous system that's much more suited to living uh, 10, 20, 30,000 years ago than it is now. And especially in the last century with all the enormous change we've had, kind of our nervous system hasn't really uh, had any kind of chance to um, adopt to that. One of the ways we see it, and uh, we talked about it, was in uh, diet. Human beings aren't designed to eat lots of sugar. We never had access to grains like wheat and everything before 10,000 years ago. So we're flooding ourselves with all this kind of um, um, so-called nutrition uh, substances anyway that uh, the human body really isn't designed to digest and make a proper use of. So that's one example of how we're, um, uh, in some sense, our, our, our basic body structures aren't that adaptable um, without a lot of deliberate practice and uh, training. Uh, it won't happen genetically very quickly. So, you know, what, what, is, what is surprising to me was that I, I had meditated for many, many years. I'd done a lot of work on myself and had many, many realizations. And then about 18 months ago, I had some somatic experience sessions. And, and someone just, the, 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 the guy I had them with, just showed me the basic breathing, which is being aware of your breath, breathing from here, mm -hmm. slowing the breath. Actually, I realized I was breathing 
over breathing. I was breathing in too much oxygen. There wasn't the right combination of oxygen and carbon dioxide. So the oxygen wasn't actually getting effectively into my cells as much as it could do because I was over breathing. And what, what was very interesting was that being someone that is a type 6 in the Enneagram and can be sometimes quite a nervous person, a fearful person, I found that doing the breathing regularly, it improved my sleep at night, it improved how I felt in the morning, and it certainly improved my ability to respond to situations which were, could have been challenging beforehand, let's say, wasn't always challenging, but could be. And it's just that simple process of changing your breathing, you do that, I found you do that, you just, as much as you can, you're aware of your breathing mm -hmm. when you can, when you're sitting at home, when you're meditating, or even you're driving your car, you can be aware of how you're breathing, and you're, if appropriate, you slow your breathing down. Mm -hmm. Everything slows down, and of course, through that, I found you got more and more in touch with your body, in touch with the feelings in the body, and that, I found and still find overrides a lot of the chemical activity here because it's bringing me to something more of a, a grounded base. Mm -hmm. And through, ironically, through that grounded base, I start to feel more of who I really am, which is the human being and also the expanded awareness. And so the more attention on the breathing, the more ability to feel the body brings about an opening. It brings about, it, it, it took me, it takes me away more from the dramas here mm. to reality and it makes me feel more balanced. Yeah. And that's, I was just surprised it had so much effect after, I don't know, 35 years of meditation which I do most days, mm -hmm. and a lot of investigative work. It's like the understanding's very important from the mind's point of view, but it has to be, for me anyway, and I think many people, combined with the ability to really feel what's happening in the body. Yeah, it's like a doorway to like, the, like the, all the unused rooms in the mansion of our consciousness almost to really yes. find out that there's so much more there and it's, yes. uh, we think it's outside of us but really by grounding our awareness in that way it's uh, and it's not just about paying attention to the breath it doesn't end there but that's where really where it begins in many ways well it's where life begins in a way well doesn't not true life actually begins there but it's the first thing we do when we're born we breathe mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it, without the breathing we're, we're not going to survive so it is such a fundamental thing and you were saying earlier about teaching in school well I wish they taught me how to breathe in school <laughs> I know it sounds really silly thing to say but it's so fundamental if you breathe properly yeah. then your body functions a lot better absolutely do you do you think you were telling in the first interview this story when you were in a Buddhist monastery meditating mm -hmm. and how you had experience of bliss and and expansion and um, and so forth and mm -hmm. then you were queuing up for in the food line and you know all your uh, greed and food and instincts came back mm -hmm. to be satisfied yeah, yeah? so um, do you think if you would have been in the same situation, connected to your breath, embodied mm -hmm. what you just experienced, what would have ha happened to your instinct? Hmm. That's a really interesting question. You know, I wonder in part if um, uh, it, a lot of it has to do, I think, you know, when we say meditation or a Buddhist meditation and things mm -hmm. like that, um, as a, Americans or as Westerners in general, we're divor divorced from the cultural context of those practices where um, uh, I've learned um, in uh, hearing Dan Brown talk and different, there's much more emphasis on actually the emotions, the feelings, in some ways they weren't body psychotherapists, but that was more 
included overall in their practices and so on. So I think in some ways when we learn about meditation, we're learning only bits and pieces of the tradition divorced from some of its broader context. So for me, I think that's what uh, turned my attention is feeling like something is missing. The meditations I was doing uh, involved a lot of, you know, evoking compassion and things like that, or um, uh, really, you know, calming and disciplining, focusing the mind, the concentration meditations. And I found them uh, wonderful and effective, but divorced from my body in some way that um, might not take place in the ordinary Tibetan culture, but at least in my culture I was largely dissociated from my body. So learning to pay attention and to be uh, open to the sensations of my body, to all the flood of emotions, to things I didn't understand why it was happening, as you said, in the trauma work sometimes movements, feelings will come that you have no conscious uh, explanation for, but that's mm -hmm. nonetheless the wisdom of the body expressing yeah. itself. Yeah. So. I wonder if I had known about that. Uh, I, I do feel very different in lunch queues now. <laughs> Not depends so how hungry you are. Yeah, it depends how hungry I am, of course. Yeah. Yeah. You also talk in the book about the Dalai Lama. Yeah, I know you had some contact with him many years mm -hmm. ago and you did some, some, some classes with him. And you feel he's somebody that has overcome the, the, the drama, if you like, of the instincts. And he, mm -hmm. You feel that he's pretty balanced. Just talk us through how you feel with him and some of the practices that you know he's done. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the most uh, striking things I noticed the very first time I saw him. I, it must have been uh, 30 years ago. I think it was he was giving a speech somewhere and I was fairly close to him. And I just remember he was laughing and um, on his way out, even before he started speaking, um, there were all these kids who went up to see him and you know he started talking and playing with them and at some point they had an announcement uh, please uh, would his holiness uh, please come to the front of the room and make the speech and you know you gotta stop playing with the children basically you know and there was something he was just so I thought hey, he's different than I am at some fundamental level even just his body alone just seems to be different there's a real discrepancy between Apparently the way I feel most of the time and the way he feels. And so just being around someone who's had that level of realization, that's not unique to Tibetan Buddhists or anything like that. Uh, many people, um, you can viscerally feel in their nervous system that something is different. You feel a sense of calm or peace or happiness or clarity with these great teachers. And. Um, uh, one of the things that he uh, spoke of uh, that it was how easy it is to change kind of your ideas about things but to really change the way you feel that took more practice but to really change the way um, I don't know if the, he used the, the, the word instinctual because some of this was through his interpreter but that's kind of what I heard but change your behavior your body your basic instincts that took the most uh, uh, advanced practices that Tibetan Buddhism had. And he was making a case in these, uh, uh, many of the initiations I went to him on these tantric practices saying, this is um, uh, really the, like a, a powerful means of transforming your entire body, your entire being, all the way down to the deepest cellular attachments um, uh, and predispositions to the uh, uh, instinctual mechanisms of the human body. So that really impressed me of how uh, serious he took it and, and how dedicated to the practices uh, one has to be. And as I began to investigate them more, I saw so many things that they did. For example, uh, some of our viewers might be familiar with the practice of a tumo meditation. The, inner heat meditation where one generates a great deal of uh, uh, by through meditation practices these Tibetan monks and pract uh, tantric practitioners can generate tremendous levels of uh, heat within their body and at first it was kind of dismissed as oh it's really cold in Tibet up in the mountains they need to keep themselves warm it, there's far more to it than that there's a, an extraordinary instinctual intelligence at work they're, they've learned to harness certain um, aspects 
of the uh, instinctual uh, structure of the human body and, and using them as a way to transform their consciousness. And it's really extraordinary that technology we've, uh, they've developed, <laughs> so we've developed, I don't think it's anything close to what they've learned on the inner, inner scale. And I think over the next 10 to 20 years, it's going to be fascinating for our culture to actually learn and start to take apart. We've begun to study the brain um, at a basic level, some of the effects of meditation, but to delve down deep and see how they're really reprogramming the deepest levels of the brain stem and the midbrain, um, I think is really uh, going to be a frontier and be fascinating uh, for us as explorers of consciousness to learn these universal mechanisms that will really allow us to apply it to uh, um, every culture, not just the exclusive uh, domain of traditional spiritual practice, including the education of children. I know I was, I was fascinated uh, reading in your book how the Dalai Lama, you, you start out saying that Dalai Lama practices every day dying. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and working on the dissolution of his body and mm -hmm. only if he manages that he can reach Buddhahood. Yeah. And I thought that's fascinating. That was one of the most, uh, I saw a beautiful picture of the Dalai Lama and meditating once without his glasses and everything when I was younger and I thought, what is he actually doing? Yeah. Like, what is, what is his experience? You know, surely mm -hmm. it's different from mine and it yeah. piqued my curiosity to learn about the practices that someone uh, at his state of evolution of consciousness still does. Mm -hmm. I mean, every morning from what I understand, he's up at four. Some, if he has the time, will meditate to eight or even longer. Um, he, I think he'd like to meditate more and do less work, but yeah. <laughs> being the bodhisattva that he is, he uh, has to help us also. Um, to delve into the uh, sophistication, the complexity of, uh, of these practices was quite, uh, in times, incredibly discouraging for me. Because every time I uh, went to initiation and, and learned about like a new practice, even at the most introductory level, I'd just be like, oh my God. God, this is so complicated. Like, it's going to take years to um, learn. I remember one of my first Buddhist teachers, I went in there and um, uh, kind of uh, after a couple of weeks of meditation, you get an interview with one of the senior teachers, the Lama there. And I kind of complained of like, well, this, you know, it seems really uh, pretty basic. You know, I, I was just starting out thinking I'm quite a great meditator. And, you know, all I'm really doing is visualizing these letters and these blocks and, you know, some, the, all these pictures of the past teachers and everything. I, I'm ready for a much more uh, sophisticated <laughs> practice now. This is pretty easy. And he, uh, he would talk with a translator and they'd converse back and forth and he said, well, we don't have anything easier for you. Because <laughs> I was feeling like I was in kindergarten and I was explaining the yeah. child school and so on. And he's like, yeah, yeah, that's about right. And they were just, you know, it wasn't mean or anything. They just, yeah. um, I didn't realize what was involved in the, mm -hmm. and the uh, extraordinary uh, um, dedication that it would take and ongoing practice just to learn about, much less practice, much less develop any proficiency whatsoever in these meditations. So, Do you, sorry. Hmm? What does this mean practically for us? I'm just looking, we've got about 10 minutes left on hmm? this program. What does this mean practically for us in the West? So we have our busy lives, we have to earn a living, everything else. People have families to look after, hmm. lots of detail, lots of distractions. I know one thing you also talk about in the book is how there's a real art that's possibly to come of distilling down. You, you've spent, you have your work in the Ridwan School and you were doing a lot of Tibetan Buddhism, many other things you've explored, the trauma mm -hmm. work, etc., shamanic work at one point. And, and yet it's taken you so many years oh. to do all this work. Yeah. And now somebody, and we have all this knowledge mm -hmm. from the East and from the West, we have the knowledge and it's bringing together and certainly with the Ridwan School, AHR Mass, it does a wonderful job of bringing the East and West together. But where is it going, do you think, in terms of taking this knowledge, distilling it down so it's something practical and realistic that somebody in the West can do in their lifestyle 
still living a life and earning some money, not going and living in a cave or whatever. Mm. And, and also balancing and transforming their instincts so they have intelligent instincts. Yeah, this would be multiple full-time jobs. <laughs> uh, the, yeah, I mean, think about everything we've talked about already, uh, the vast diversity of fields from psychotherapy, the treatment of trauma, meditation, more advanced uh, Buddhist type, uh, more complex meditations, um, the psychological aspects, learning about the neurobiology. Um, it, it takes, uh, I felt it's, it's taken me years and years to develop some level of expertise in each of these and now beginning to synthesize it and put it into a more integrated fashion that's more appropriate. How do we take all this knowledge and put it in a way that people can understand it and implement it in their lives? One of the things that it's, it's forced me to do in terms of being an educator is to find ways to convey all this information in a more integrated, compact way. And that's why I've developed lots uh, with my uh, help uh, from my uh, uh, digital friends in the, the Bay Area and San Francisco, kind of Apple headquarters and uh, this type of media environment, is to produce animation, 3D animation, that explains what's happening in the brain, how these meditation practices are done, because people need a way uh, to learn about it. They're not going to become experts in all these different fields, but they do need to have a picture of how this information works in their own bodies. And I found that uh, making, uh, instead of just writing books about it, which is important for specialists, but to, uh, for the average person to see visual depictions of all this in an integrated kind of condensed way really accelerates their own um, willingness to try these practices and their own understanding. It's almost like an accelerated form of learning that's needed in today's uh, kind of modern digital world, especially for the younger generation. There are just too many books in too many specialties. They need a more integrated education system. So that's step number one is just learning about it and, and as the Tibetans would say, moistening the mind stream to be open to it and finding um, what are the key uh, universal human principles about how the nervous system works and designing uh, meditation and different practices for people that are very attuned to their own cultural environment. If you take a lot of people and show them some kind of Tibetan system or Taoist tradition or all the different ways we have uh, the, the great ethnic cultural diversity, um, it's simply going to be too alien to a lot of people. But to get them to start with their breathing and just paying attention to the breathing is a start. And I'm hopeful that our, all this vast studying that we're doing about uh, both in psychotherapy, trauma treatment, meditation, will lead to more and more um, universal principles of how the it's human a mind isn't it, exactly yeah. functions yeah. and how we can make that accessible to more and more people, mm -hmm. kind of translating it into the universal language of uh, the human body, I think is going to be um, a great starting place. I'm very hopeful that that, that can actually happen. You know, um, one thing um, our teacher said, I mean, we have the same teacher in the Redmond School, Hamid, mm -hmm. Uh, I actually was reading that in one of his latest book and he says that after writing 15 books has probably one of the biggest spiritual school on the planet mm -hmm. he says I'm writing all these books and I'm teaching you all these things only for your mind to relax <laughs> because that's the only thing mm -hmm. which needs to happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. I guess breathing is the start. <laughs> <laughs> it is. <laughs> well, it is, and this is you know what I what I, I discover more and more for myself. It's the it's the simplicity that is really the breakthrough, and it's um, understanding is great, and understanding ha has a lot of value, especially for me, someone with a relatively strong mind. And it's mm -hmm. very important understanding, but. The, the real quantum shifts are to do with simplicity and just just the breathing and the mindfulness of being aware of what the body's feeling mm -hmm. and what that the impact that has on me that 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 provides a lot and I, I think I would go along with Renata somehow that 
maybe the maybe the simplicity and the synthesis that we're talking about of all the different traditions, maybe they meet somewhere. And and I think for anybody that's watching this program, well, maybe I should ask you the same question in a minute. But I think my answer for people that aren't are watching this program who want to know how to start is just start with something very simple, mm -hmm. but make that a kind of a commitment. Absolutely. A kind of a, yeah. Discipline is not a great word. I know it's not a pleasant word, but commitment that they, they honour. Mm -hmm. They say, "Well, I'm going to start. It's only five minutes a day. It's ten minutes a day. Whatever." Mm -hmm. And then, it, and if then it starts to be a journey. It starts to be an adventure. It starts to be something that actually can be very exciting at times. Can be very yeah. stimulating, but not overstimulating. Mm -hmm. It's something, and then, and then the world starts to open, and and, and we get which. Um, you, you have whole chapters that we haven't touched in your book on this, where the, the, how, how, the, how the instinct, instincts can be tuned to really bring out our potential in a certain area of life. And you have, just, just very quickly run through the, the main chapters you have on different people. You have one on Abraham uh, Lincoln, one on Madonna. Uh, Oprah Winfrey. Oprah Winfrey, yeah. Uh, yeah. Tiger. Tiger, Tiger Woods, Woods, yes. Yeah. Uh, even Abraham Lincoln. Yes. It was the subject of a new movie now. I, I yes. quite enjoyed that, Steven yeah. Spielberg's uh, understanding of his uh, this capacity for persistence in the face of adversity. That's really quite extraordinary. And not just his own um, perseverance, but the uh, fact that he was trying to free slaves, uh, uh, you know, an abominable American tradition, but that was so engraved into our society that he had to carry out this fight and hold that kind of uh, will and persistence in the face of uh, opposition, bloodshed, probably the worst point in our history. And um, to bear that burden and to represent something even more than yourself um, as a form of uh, one of the highest forms of instinctual intelligence I can imagine. So I, I, I just have a question. You know, sometimes in the most relaxed situation. I'm sitting there, feel completely chilled out of the meditation. This grabbing feeling, like a probably a grabbing instinct mm -hmm. is coming up. And it feels like for action, for life. Is this something healthy or unhealthy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Something in me, this instinct wants to uh -huh. leave this place of rest uh -huh. yeah. and just wants to go out there uh -huh. and experience it. Oh, right. judging by the way you're laughing and smiling, <laughs> it seems pretty healthy to me. <laughs> I don't know, you know, is that, is that just an addiction to something or mm -hmm. some kind of chemical which mm -hmm. tries to I get attention? I think the only attention. way to find out is to really uh, get inside <laughs> of it. And, you know, yeah, what is this, so. you know, your hand is going like this and yes. start to feel the sensations of the grabbing itself and, uh, yeah, and yeah. that beautiful smile on your face and what does that <laughs> feel like? And yeah. To fully inhabit it. Yeah. To, to but, explore it. But really, Ted, just listening to you and, and this book helped me so much well, to understand to a completely different level in myself. Mm -hmm. And hopefully more accepting to those. Uh, yeah, of course. I mean, the question isn't yeah. so much is it bad or is it good, it's no. what is it like? It just wants yeah. to be there as well <laughs> and, and recognized and be in the light exactly. and seen. Yeah. 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 That makes me very happy when you yeah. say that. Yeah, me too. <laughs> so, we need to draw to a close. Okay. Yes. And uh, there's so much more we could talk about because the, uh, as you rightly say in the introduction to the book, the, the word, the world of the instincts has not really been explored in a contemporary way very much. Mm -hmm. And uh, certainly Ted's book, Instinctive Intelligence, is a great start. And uh, some, of, some of it can be a little bit dense, but other parts of it where there's the chapters built around various personalities, people, famous people that you would know, give it much more a, a kind of accessible feel. And, and there's, I think there's something for everybody in this book, whatever the stage they are at their, their journey as such. So, Ted, you've flown over especially from Norway for the interview. Really appreciate mm -hmm. that. You're welcome. Thank you, Renata, for joining me here. This was an impromptu one because uh, two other guests who were going to join Ted on the panel got stuck in the snow. So. Uh, Hopefully we've uh, filled the void, so to speak, <laughs> and uh, 
I think it's for us to enjoy it anyway. Is there not also something else to come? A kind of. Well, on the internet, certainly, what we what we're going to do is put um, after this program both a meditation and also um, a presentation that Ted's put together. And he's given us the, uh, well, the uh, covering the animation. Yes, the, the animation. Yeah. So. But anyway, thank you very much for watching Conscious TV and I uh, hope we see you again soon. Goodbye. Goodbye. Hi, I'm Ted Usatinsky. As a follow-up to the interviews we've done with Conscious TV, I'm going to be introducing you to a brief uh, meditation practice involving paying attention to your breath. It's quite simple and also can be used uh, as a means of reducing stress in day-to-day uh, -day living and also as an introduction to uh, uh, more extended uh, meditation practices. But let's begin simply uh, by sitting down and finding a posture that's comfortable for you. Ideally, we'd like the spine to be as straight as possible. So um, for some of you, that will involve uh, moving up in your chair a bit, perhaps sitting on your sits bones, and uh, also finding some kind of uh, support in your back or even taking your back off the back of the chair in order to have your spine a little uh, straighter, not sitting too far back or too uh, slumped over in some way. But it's one that just feels natural without too much effort to keep your spine aligned as if there were a string running through your spine coming out the top of your head and just pulling your head up also so your head isn't heavy and kind of sitting on top of your shoulders too much. The important thing is to be comfortable and this posture may change over time also. The basic uh, technique is to, uh, on the in-breath, breathe in through your nose into your lower belly. And the idea to breathe in uh, more air into your um, lower lungs, especially that area that kind of pushes out your belly, is to invite uh, the activation of what are called parasympathetic fibers that are more predominant in the lower lo lobes of the lung. This will help induce a relaxing, calming response. And also uh, help you take away from kind of the habitual uh, familiarity many of us have of breathing too much into the upper part of our lungs, kind of gasping for air um, in a way that activates our sympathetic nervous system and can produce uh, more stress in our system. So it's simply taking uh, a fairly big, full breath through your nose, down through your nose and into your lower lungs in a way that pushes out uh, your lower belly. <sighs> Some people like to breathe, uh, they exhale through their mouth. Um, in many ways it's better to do it through your nose. It helps better with uh, carbon dioxide uh, regulation in the body and that in turn will produce more balanced oxygen levels. So again, the basic meditation is simply to begin by breathing through your nose. Notice the sensations of the air going through your nostrils, through your windpipe. And that's effective, pushing out uh, your lower belly. In fact, it might be helpful to exaggerate that at first, uh, helping your belly just push out a bit. Letting it extend an inch or two and just either breathing out through your mouth or through your nose. Now, in order to sustain your awareness of the breath and especially on the physical sensations of breathing, what I do, or encourage uh, my clients and students to do, is to notice the sensations that are actually occurring in your belly and lower chest while you're breathing. 
So for example, on that breath right there, I feel one of the things I feel first is like a stretching of my skin on uh, my stomach. It's important not to breathe too quickly, just at a pace that's natural. And this breath I felt uh, could feel the air more intensely coming through my nose, uh, hitting my nostrils. So in a way you're just noticing the sensations of the breath, whether they're occurring in your nostrils, maybe in your windpipe, but especially in your belly. So now as I'm sensing, I'm noticing, uh, I feel a little bit constrained. I have my pants on and my belt puts a little pressure against the front of my belly. Again, there's no right or wrong way to do this or uh, that your clothes should be looser or more tight. It's simply a matter of noticing the sensations. Because if you're doing this out in the real world at work or with your children, uh, you might not have time to uh, set up the ideal conditions. The whole object of it is just to pay attention to the sensations. <sighs> so on that breath, I could feel uh, a kind of a sense of uh, expansion in my stomach as if I'm pushing out uh, an internal pressure. I'm also noticing a bit of a downward uh, pressure as I really let more air come into my lower lungs. I'm also hearing the sound of my own breathing Noticing the, this light kind of high-pitched uh, tone, uh, almost a whisper of a tone as the air passes through my nostrils. I'm also noticing I'm a bit hungry. My stomach feels a bit empty. So again, these are just sensations just to pay attention to. There are no good sensations bad sensations, right sensations, or wrong ones. None of them are more enlightened than the other. They're simply sensations and the very act of paying attention to them begins to exert uh, a, uh, effect on the nervous system of calming, relaxing awareness, settling the mind. So as I took a few more breaths, I noticed there was a little bit of tension in my legs that I was using to kind of hold myself up a bit, and able to relax that, relax into the weight. So that's all there really is to it. Just keep watching your breath, noticing the sensations in your belly and in your body. Slowing down. If your mind has thoughts, uh, distractions, you find yourself thinking about what you're going to do later, emails you need to answer, and what you're going to eat later, and so on, uh, they're okay just to notice them too. Come back to the breath. And the truth is, if you're 
pinch for time and you can only get a few breaths in, that too is, can be very helpful in just lowering the feverish pitch of our nervous system in stressful situations. And if you have more time uh, to continue the exploration, continue watching the breath and watching the sensations, paying attention to how much, how uh, the volume of air is coming into your belly, how big it feels or how small it feels, the size, the pressure. Sometimes you feel the temperature of the air coming in if it's cool or warm. Just start to notice more and more the sensations and the perceptions that are arising directly in your body. And continue with this as long as you like or feels comfortable and see how it goes and see where that leads you. Well, thank you very much. And I wish you luck with this meditation. We are at a threshold of human evolution. A unique time in human history where we now have access to the vast teachings of the world's spiritual traditions and the scientific means to understand how these practices work at the deepest neurobiological levels. People across the globe are hungry for this information. They are discovering that meditation, prayer, ritual, and energetic yogas can reduce stress, improve intelligence, help us connect with others, and guide us deeper into greater self-knowledge and ultimately help us explore the nature of life, death, and reality itself. For thousands of years, Buddhist meditators have been exploring the secrets of human consciousness. Now, the Dalai Lama is working directly with scientists and university laboratories all over the world, creating new maps of the nervous system, revealing how this ancient wisdom can actually rewire the brain, reshape our view of reality and help us envision new educational paradigms for future generations. Welcome to the groundbreaking work of instinctual intelligence. Our mission is to provide you with cutting-edge multimedia educational materials for advanced learning and personal transformation. In these videos, lectures, and workshops, you will learn to unlock the extraordinary neurobiological wisdom encoded within these esoteric practices. You'll be inspired to deepen your practices as you see exactly how they restructure the human nervous system. It's now possible for the first time in human history to bring this knowledge alive in a way that is fresh and relevant to the modern world. Drawing on the practices of Tibetan Buddhism and other spiritual traditions, we'll learn how leading edge science is revealing the underlying universal principles for systematically developing the fullest potentials of human consciousness. Join us for a guided investigation of these five essential paradigms of meditation. 
Learn how the basic meditation practices of the world's wisdom traditions bring us into a greater awareness of our embodied sensations. We'll see how these foundational practices are scientifically proven to reduce stress and bring us more in touch with the present moment, opening the door to a deeper exploration of consciousness itself. The ability to focus attention, improve memory, and develop higher levels of executive functioning are all essential for success in today's world. We are discovering the specific forms of meditation that develop the neural systems underlying these cognitive capacities, and why they are essential for deepening one's practice. Opening our hearts to loving relationships is an important goal of every spiritual path. Modern science is now demonstrating how specific forms of meditation activate mirror neuron networks, allowing us to empathetically connect with each other and cultivate a deeper compassion for all beings. We now know that long-term practice of meditation increases neuroplasticity, the ability of the brain to rewire itself. Learn how the cumulative effects of systematic practice enhances our capacity to regulate our emotions, and even more powerfully, to harness our instinctual energies and align them with our noblest aspirations. Here, we enter into the deepest mysteries of human consciousness. Discover how the most advanced tantric practices are designed to bring awareness into the mysterious realms at the edge of life and death. New research is emerging that points to the potential for these practices to activate stem cells, dramatically accelerate neuroplasticity, and even begin to alter the expression of DNA itself. The emergent scientific study of these tantric practices also reveals the capacity for consciousness to evolve beyond familiar physical forms. And enter into a greater community of being that we are only beginning to imagine. To imagine. It's a great time to be alive. Never before have we been able to explore systematically the infinite potentials of humanity and the boundless nature of consciousness. With the accumulated wisdom and elegant beauty of spiritual knowledge, and the objective insight of science. Through this integration of our hearts, our minds, our bodies, and spirits, we will forever change how we relate to each other, how we know ourselves, and how we educate our children. Join us in this adventure, preparing for a future that is beyond our imaginations where we are all going together, one step at a time.
And it's been exciting. I think, you know, uh, the Dalai Lama exemplifies the uh, curiosity of um, both cultures to learn about this and to uh, go further into um, what we know about the brain and spiritual practice. So we're going to start with a basic uh, picture of the brain here. For those of you who are uh, not familiar with it, uh, we're going to go into some detail, but if remember just a few basic things that will help you grasp what we're talking about tonight. This blue area here, the large area on top, is called the cortex. And that's where most of our uh, thinking takes place. We, our uh, senses are processed there, our memories are stored there, and our capacity to think and integrate what we're experiencing and our perceptions with memories and help us navigate the world all kind of takes place in the cortex. It does many other things, but that's a, just a basic way to think about it. The area in purple, this kind of horn shape area that has two sides, is a simplified representation of what's called the limbic system. And that's where our feelings and emotions are processed. And this area down below, the red stem, is uh, what you could call the reptilian brain, uh, the brain stem, where most of our instinctual uh, impulses and basic body uh, regulation functions, like our breathing and our heartbeat, are regulated in that area. So there are many parts to the brain, obviously, and, and that is just a basic uh, a thing to keep in mind, a basic scheme to help you remember that just the top, the cortex, the middle part is the emotions, and the red part, the bottom part, are the instincts. This area in the back, this gold area, is what's called the cerebellum. It kind of acts as an auxiliary processor for the brain that helps coordinate movement and many of the complex calculations and functions that the brain does. So tonight we're going to look specifically at this front area called the frontal lobes and how it interacts with the lower portions. So if the brain science gets a bit much for you and uh, the details get too much, I want you to just think of uh, two basic concepts that we're going to kind of refer to over and over. One is um, uh, what's called emotional regulation, and that is the capacity of these frontal lobes to signal areas in the emotional area that kind of calm some of our fearful, angry, anxious responses. And also the capacity of these same frontal lobes that we're talking about to reach deeper into the brainstem and begin to uh, alter even our instinctual functions, the things that are primarily unconscious. So of all the things we're going to talk about tonight, it's going to get a little more complex than this, but if you remember those two basic concepts, or basically one, is that the capacity of this front part of the brain to reach into lower areas that are primarily unconscious. That'll be the main takeaway from uh, all the brain science that we're going to present. The main uh, thing we're going to talk about tonight is deity yoga. This is the core of uh, Tibetan tantric practices, and especially uh, uh, and primarily in what are called the um, uh, generation stage uh, level of a tantric practice, of a of sadhana, of a, a meditation uh, program. Now this is um, the glorious uh, Vajra Yogini as it's practiced within the uh, Drikung Kagyu tradition and other traditions um, th with a full um, uh, uh, decor that she wears, the necklace of uh, skulls, the uh, blade chopper, the scoop of brains in her left hand, the staff, and the crown and so on. And many people have seen this uh, beautiful depictions of various deities. They're all throughout this room. Um, what many people don't know who aren't familiar with P Tibetan Buddhist practice is that one actually visualizes oneself as this deity. And you enter in subjectively into their experience as if that were your body. Here you're looking at the right hand, the chopper blade that she holds there, her earrings, the severed head, the necklace. Now you're seeing her left hand, the scoop of brains. So when you do these practices, you're actually entering in to these deities in all the detail, all the form, the necklaces, the staff, every aspect, the red skin. You're completely subjectively embedding yourself into this uh, body of a deity. And that to me is a, uh, a fascinating um, and, and has extraordinary uh, neurobiological implications and really 
uh, you could say, begins to turn up the heat on the transformational practice. Also, for those of you familiar going a bit deeper, when you do the deity practice, most of them involve what are called body mandalas, where you're actually visualizing different deities in different locations in your body. This again is from the Vajra Yogini practice, um, showing uh, the 64 petal root chakra, uh, chakra at the navel, um, with a Tibetan symbol upon some uh, sun and moon disks. And these, uh, specifically these deities are lined up along the central channel, the center of the body. Now there's a great deal of variation in these practices. Different deities have different configurations of deities throughout the body. And this is just one example. The um, other practice we're going to talk about tonight and the other phase of the tantric practice is called the completion stage. And this uh, primarily in every uh, lineage that I know of, maybe there are ones that don't do it this way, but the, the hallmark of the beginning of the completion stage yogas are what is called the inner heat yoga or the tumo yoga. And this is from the uh, six yogas of Naropa, um, the depiction of the uh, li an alignment of the, of the chakras at the head center, the 32-petaled uh, lotus there, the 16-petaled uh, lotus at the throat, the eight at the heart, and the 64 at the uh, navel. And with the, uh, the center channel and the uh, um, right and left uh, side channels also. Uh, this is the way the visualization is done. There's also some um, uh, symbols that are there, some seed syllables um, that aren't depicted. But that, this is, just gives you a basic outline of part of the visualization of how this is done. And it's really considered, uh, uh, this practice of tumo is considered, uh, as Mil the great Milarepa once said, it's like the, um, the, the powerful elixir that really transforms meditation and gives the potential, potential to bring about Buddhahood in this very life, to really change one at an instinctual embodied level and also create profound con uh, changes in consciousness. The basic practice of Tumo Yoga, uh, I'm simplifying here a bit, is to visualize a very strong source of heat uh, in, a, in a small triangle, a small thin triangle, uh, right directly in the center channel, sitting on top of the uh, navel chakra. And there's much more to it than that, but that just gives you a basic um, idea. Many of uh, these practices, uh, perhaps you've heard about the research that was done early on <coughs> in the cold uh, Himalayan winters. Uh, the monks would have contests um, when they were practicing uh, Tumo Yoga. They would uh, sit outside and there were two or three of them would line up and they would put, dip uh, some uh, sheets in um, ice water and throw them on their back and they would have a contest over the course of the night who could dry the most of these ice cold sheets on their backs by generating this inner heat. So it's a very real phenomenon. I mean, it's been medically tested and um, some of the changes in temperature um, have been quite uh, basically inexplicable by modern science until we've done some uh, recent research on it. So that's kind of an overview of some of the areas of meditation that we're going to look at tonight. The next uh, type of thing that's deeply built into the nervous system, and it's best you often have to almost get off the surface of the earth to really appreciate it, is that we are embedded in a field of gravity. And the sensation of gravity and the function of gravity is deeply a part of being a human being, and it's so... Um, so consistent, so syntonic with our experience that we wouldn't even question it. Of course, when I drop my pointer, things fall down. I have to balance myself to stand up. Um, we, we take it uh, and we live in a very actually narrowly constrained field of gravity because when there's a rapid change in gravity, we don't, uh, we don't say, oh, I'm experiencing a change in gravity. We, falling down is a rapid change in gravity. We've evolved from a long line of human beings who are very concerned about gravity because our uh, early ancestors who were up climbing trees and didn't pay attention to gravity fell, they died, they didn't reproduce, they weren't your ancestors. So we're all very <laughs> attuned to gravity in a way that's so deeply embedded that you know, it's even odd to talk about it or to challenge it. And I think uh, when I see these pictures of a baby in a womb and I think we all 
kind of long for that sensation to be free of gravity, especially those of us who are getting older and start to feel a little more acutely sometimes than we want to, the sensations of gravity. So, uh, and this is part of the genius of uh, the Buddha and the Buddhist teachings are to identify things that we just take so ordinarily for granted yet would still constrict our consciousness and still uh, limit our um, understanding and experiential awareness of Buddha, of the true Buddha nature that's possible. So we're going to take a look at the way that they um, began to disrupt the sense of gravity. Gravity is primarily, uh, we experience it primarily as mediated along our spinal cord. Keeping upright is one of the central ways that we uh, experience gravity. And there's a whole uh, neurobiology to it, and we're gonna, just going to take a brief look at, at where in the spinal cord. We're going to enter right into the spinal cord and see how the sense of gravity is constructed to really appreciate one of the extraordinary turning points of Buddha consciousness that takes us out of just the purely physical and into realms of consciousness that are freed from the physical. Doesn't reject the physical, but adds something to our experience. It allows us to go beyond our instinctual identification. We can now enter into and see uh, these uh, body mandala practices now in a different light, especially the ones in particular we're gonna look at are the ones that are uh, aligned along the spine where these uh, 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 reticular uh, uh, gravitational muscles are. So again, now we're going to uh, not only look at it from the outside, but this is how it would be subjectively for someone doing this Vajrayogini Vajra Yogini meditation. We're going to enter in through this uh, navel chakra. We're going to be looking down through it. There's the seed syllable in the middle. And here are the various deities lined up in a stack and you're looking down as if you were doing this meditation. And what, uh, how do they practice uh, kind of systematically shutting off our gravitational, our habitual gravitational responses? It's through a slow and systematic dissolution of each one of these deities. You're actually withdrawing consciousness from its habitual pattern in a gravitational field. And the extraordinary wisdom, I mean, this stuff is just like so cutting edge in neuroscience. And to think that they developed these practices hundreds and thousands of years ago, <laughs> it just blows me away. 